Reading today again from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 12. After writing about the variety of gifts of the Spirit, Paul here writes about the body of Christ. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. May God add blessing to the reading and the hearing of these words. If you would please stand, if you are able, for the reading of the gospel. Continuing today to read from the Sermon of the Mount, chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When was the last time you witnessed an act of what you would consider great courage? Probably depends on how it is that you evaluate great courage. Uh, Maybe we would name those moments when uh, we see firefighters or police officers or EMTs running into burning buildings when everyone else is running away and, and we know that they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake of others. Maybe it's those stories we hear about soldiers who are willing to throw themselves on a grenade to, to save their unit or, or, or maybe that, that soldier who runs out into the middle of active shooting to drag a buddy who's been wounded to safety. I wonder, would you also consider courage someone who sees a lonely kid sitting in a lunchroom and decides to go over and sit by them or invite them to come over and sit with their group of friends? Uh, Would you consider it an act of courage to stop someone from telling a, a joke that denigrates women or people of a certain ethnicity? Is that courage? You know the next question. It's, it's not just when have you witnessed a, an act of great courage. May, maybe the deeper question is when have you been a part of an act of great courage? And if you've run into a, building, a burning building to save someone, then God bless you. But most of us probably have not. So... Can we think of things that we have done that we might think are courageous? And I'm going to guess you're going to struggle to find that. Because very, very few of us consider anything we've ever done as particularly courageous. I wonder what our faith has to do with those acts of courage. Jesus says this morning from the Sermon on the Mount, as, as Pastor Cheryl said, After the Beatitudes, Jesus then says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how does it regain its saltiness? It's not really worth anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket, but instead on a lampstand so that it gives light to all in the house. So let your light shine through your good works so that God in heaven may receive glory. I've said it before. This person or that person is the salt of the earth. And as I was thinking about that that this week, I I wondered, what what specifically do I mean? I mean, I know when I see it, but but what is it that I see when, when I call someone the salt of the earth? And for me... That there is an authenticity to that person, a, a down-to-earthness, a, a not putting on of airs, a, an authenticity, a, a generosity, a, an expectation that the behavior they have for the most important person in the world would be the same behavior they have 
for the one considered least important in the world, the salt of the earth. You know, we probably don't understand the value that salt had in biblical times completely. It, it was so important that it was often used as a way of paying someone. That's actually where we get the word salary. Because in that time, before there was refrigeration, salt was used to preserve food so that people could eat it long after they otherwise would have been able to. Salt was used to clean wounds, and that sounds quite painful, but if you think about it, it would be worth it if you didn't have any other way. Salt was also used in the way that we use it to enhance the taste of other foods. So maybe we can't remember really clearly the last time we saw an ordinary person like us acting with great courage. But I'm going to guess that if I asked you, who was a person in your life that encouraged you? That saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself? That, that found a way to believe in you when you didn't believe in yourself? That, that found a way to see... A, a kind of potential that you might never have given yourself credit for having. And, and did that voice, did that person, did that experience with that encourager, did it make a difference for you? And might it, might it be that that was a voice that helped you to perhaps have the courage to be who God needed or needs you to be? To understand that all of us, as Paul says last week, all of us have been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. All of of us have been given gifts to use for God's vision in the world. But sometimes it takes someone else to help us see that what we take for granted in our lives as just something anybody can do, in fact, not everybody can do. And that if we're willing to embrace that in ourselves, if, if we're willing to see ourselves through someone else's eyes then we might be more willing to use that gift for the sake of the world. Maybe, in fact, because of someone else's voice, you have been more courageous than you think. It's worth considering. I bet an easier question for you, or maybe maybe not, when have you been that voice of encouragement for someone else's courage to be who God called them to be? When have you been that voice that sees promise in someone and is willing to tell them that? When have you risked the vulnerability to, to say to someone, my goodness, I don't know if you know this or not, but the strength that you showed in that moment, the compassion you had for that person that no one else is knowing, that, that sensitivity, that, that perception of what was going on with someone when the rest of us, the, the rest of us didn't see it, that's really a gift. I'll bet you can think of a time or two when you've been that voice that became someone else's courage. That's, I think, what Jesus is talking about in our scriptures today. I think he's talking about that part of salt that that enhances the the taste of the food. It's not an end in and of itself. You can get sick if if you eat salt. But if you use it, Sparingly, perhaps. But if you use it correctly, it makes the taste of that food better. If used appropriately and in a timely fashion, our words can become that which brings about courage in another. We are better together. We are not meant to live this life alone. Jesus says, salt when it loses its saltiness cannot be restored. Our life without using, being used to enhance others is hard to retain in energy or vigor or, or an embrace or an intrigue in, in life, a willingness to take risks. But when we, when we find ourselves encouraging others, it's interesting. It may just be that we find ourselves also encouraged or more courageous. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. 
A city on a hill cannot be hid. No, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket. Instead, it's put on a lampstand so that it can bring light to all in the house. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to God. And yet, so often we are encouraged not to be in the limelight Sometimes mistakenly believing that that's what Jesus means by humility. But in fact, what I would tell you is that too often that's a cop out. Because you see, when we believe it's being humble to, to keep our gifts to ourselves, to, to keep our time to ourselves, to, to not step out in, in advocacy for someone who, whose voice cannot be heard because of a different, difference in power, You see, we're protecting ourselves. And Jesus isn't asking that of us. Jesus is asking that we let our light shine so that someone else in greater need, perhaps, might have their path brightened so that they can follow it for their gifts. This movie clip that you're going to see in just a minute is from an, a movie from, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago about a man who was hired to come in to deal with an inner city basketball team full of boys, and they're very talented, but they're flunking out of school. And he decides, along with the principal, that their getting an education is vastly more important than basketball. And he reaches a point where when they are not, in fact, all passing their classes, he puts a log chain around the, the doors of the basketball gym. And interestingly enough, it's the adults, some of the parents in the school boards who become angry that the boys aren't being allowed to play basketball. And he gets fired. And this is what happens as he comes out of his office having packed up, packed up his box. If we could see that video clip, please. Sir, they can cut the chain off the door, but they can't make us play. We've decided we're going to finish what you started, sir. Yeah, so leave us be, coach. We got shit to do, sir. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine as children do. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. Sir, I just want to say thank you. You saved my life. Thank you, sirs. All of you. Maybe our examples aren't quite so clear. But I, I think the message of, of the poem that Marianne Williamson wrote that. I think the message of that poem that that young man gave is the message in a different way that Jesus is giving us. To let our light shine so that others might see our good works and give glory to God. So again, we're not doing what God calls us to do 
to bring ourselves glory. We're not using the gifts that we have, some which put us out in the limelight. We aren't using those gifts for ourselves. We're using them as an instrument to be a light on the path for others and to be, and to be lifted up perhaps ourselves. Paul reminds us that, <laughs> that we don't all have the same gifts. So, some gifts are, are, are out in front where everybody sees, and some gifts are, are behind the curtain, but without which the show could not go on. Some gifts are a specific talent that is very clear to see, and other gifts, other gifts are a development of a skill and a willingness to use that developed skill for the good of others. Paul says today that for just as the body have, has many members... The one body has many members, so all the members, even though many, are one body. So it is with Christ Jesus. For we were baptized by one baptism through one spirit, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free. And we were made to drink of the same spirit. Paul is kind of bringing all together that, that table of grace that we celebrated on World Communion. Paul is bringing together that, that table that says as different as we are uh, around the spirit of God through Christ, we are brought together and it takes all of us because Paul will go on in that chapter and, and talk about a hand can't do without a foot and, a, and an ear can't do without an eye. And we, friends, can't do without one another. And I don't know that in our world today, we really believe that anymore. You see, the, the message that comes out of this book has kind of fallen out of favor. It's not trending up, we might say. Because it's very easy to look at churches and find our worst Find our hypocritical moments. Find our, our judgment and our intolerance. Find, find those places where we have not opened our doors in invitation. And then we have a decision to make. Do we, in the midst of a world that says, you're no longer relevant and we don't want a part of you, do we continue to decide to be grace? To not allow ourselves to be beaten down by someone else's judgment of who we are without knowing us? And can we decide to remain salty? Can we decide to remain light? Can we decide to, to have the courage to live our faith when no one expects us to or even wants us to, perhaps? Can we choose our principled lives that are given foundation? In the Jesus of the Gospels who gives us the Beatitudes and says in purity of heart and in making peace and in meekness and in mercy, there is blessing. Not primarily for ourselves, you see, but for others to be the salt, to be the light. Are we willing to do that when it's not popular? Because friends, that's the world in which we live. And that's, that's what we're inviting each one of us to invest in. With our dollars, certainly. But more importantly, with our lives. With what we commit to. Our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. So are we putting our light under a bushel basket? Yeah, I do good things, but don't ask me why, because I don't want to have to talk about my faith in Jesus Christ or my membership in a church. Yeah, I am a person of, of, of seeking to be honest in all the moments of I can, to be authentic, to, to open my heart in kindness and generosity, but don't, don't ask me why, because I don't want to connect it necessarily to my faith or certainly to my membership in a church. Is that what we've become? Or do we perhaps think 
and believe what Jesus says. That if we will remain salt, if we will remain light, if we will not hide under a bushel basket because it's safer, that in fact, the light we shine to the world (laughs) may be part of what will bring God's world back together in a way that is good for all of us. I'll leave you with this challenge. Theologian David Lewis that I've talked about before. In his thoughts on this particular gospel lesson, he says, invite and encourage your people to keep keep a salt and light log. I want to say journal, but that sounds too sort of overwhelming. But, But in other words, just keep in your computer, on your phone, or someplace, when you notice acts of, of light and acts of salt. When you see other people enhancing the life of someone else. When you experience someone else's light, their joy, their hope. Encouraging. Giving courage to another. Because you see, once we start opening our hearts and our minds and our spirits... By bringing to awareness our desire to see moments of salt and light. It becomes more of the norm. And once we accept that, we become part of that. Be salt and light for the sake of the world, for your sake, and for God's sake. Amen.